hopefully we now are live just I'll put a message up hopefully somebody can tell me that they can hear me or see me and that everything's coming through loud and clear then we can get on to start taking some some of those questions I can see some questions coming through already So once I, I'll just leave it for a minute or so and um, hopefully everything's all loud and clear. Yep, looks like I'm getting some uh, messages through so hopefully that's all okay. That's the thing with live streams, we've got this delay of around about 15 to 20 seconds um, so that's the, the bit that's a little bit awkward with it, like I say, when we've got that delay. Obviously, as more people come into the stream as well, I'm going to get more and more questions. So if I can't get your question because it's uh, rolling off of the chat screen, ask it again in a few minutes perhaps and I'll try and get, get to it then. I've also got a few questions as well on pastels and oils. I've got some notes in front of me. So I'll also be dipping into those. So ask me any any art questions you want, and I'll just wait for a few to to uh, roll in. Okay, I'll just go to a couple of quick ones now to start. EKS says I'm worried about the toxicity of pastels, as I only have a tiny area to work in in my bedroom. What advice can you give me on this? On my YouTube channel, if you just type in the search toxic, I actually go into that in depth on there. But suffice to say, when you're using pastel matte paper, if you're just using pencils, you're not creating tons of dust. Don't go blowing your work. You know, if you take some precautions like that, then to be honest, pastels are one of the least toxic of, of the uh, medias that you can try or you can use anyway but like I said on that video I really go into that much more detail saying about the toxicity of each pastel as well so check that one out and I can uh, help you out with that what else have we got here let's have a quick look have I tried the new Lux archival paper by Brush and Pencil Co I've been trying to get hold of that for a little while now in the UK just can't get hold of it at all um, since before Christmas I've been having a look at that. To be honest I got a feeling it's going to be very similar to the other sanded papers that I've tried uh, in the past and I've once again I've got a YouTube video on those. Because they're sanded papers they generally um, create more dust. The, the, tooth of the, paper, the tooth of the paper actually fills up easier because the, because of the rough surface the pastel is going into it. And I then found that, um, funnily enough, it didn't take as many layers and the blending was starting to go smudgy. I've got a, a video on um, a sanded paper where I'm demonstrating what I'm saying now. So, as I said, I am waiting for some paper to come, but with the present climate, that doesn't seem to be happening anytime soon. And the indications I'm getting from the UK art stores that I've seen it, as stock uh, due to come in the prices are really really high so I will try it out hopefully it's really good hopefully it'll be another alternative for people because I don't I know some of you can't get pastel mat very easily in your country so I will get back to you on those um, somebody else says they're wondering how to frame uh, pastels properly Personally, I take it to a, a framer myself, but what he actually does, he has a double mount board. You can use um, what they would ca call a spacer mount as well, which is at the bottom. They'll put, even put in a third strip of mount. That brings the, the artwork from the glass even more and creates actually a little bit of a trough there so that the any dust that does come off there as little as it could be would fall in there rather than on the mount 
What they then do is uh, frame it behind glass with a normal backing board on there. So pretty much the same as you would frame a watercolour. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, let's have a quick look for something else. Any news on the daylight lighting? I'm waiting to see what news you might have that I mentioned earlier it's from Doris. Yep, just got to do the video. I've got some of the lights set up by the side of me. It's out of screenshot. These new duo uh, double light um, stands. I've also got a great offer. If you're in the USA or the UK, you'll be able to get a really good discount on there. I never, I never really affiliate with anything um, unless it's really, really a good product. Now. I've got my brushes with Rosemary and Co, but I don't earn a penny out of that. That's just for the ease of people to know what brushes I use. I do earn a small commission with Pan Pastels because you've seen I, I use them a lot anyway. And the only other thing is going to be this, this daylight um, bulb setup because, well, by far it's the best. I wish I'd used them years ago. The lighting is just spot on and the ease, as you will see in my next video, of uh, how you can just attach them to tables and they work at all different angles and a very reasonable price. So that video is going to come out very soon. Right, what else have we got? I have lots of soft pastels, unison, etc. Can I grind them down and use like pan pastels? In theory, yes. The issue would be the grinding process, you would then be producing a lot of dust. Whereas with the pans, they are actually already compressed in the pan. So you're minimizing dust by using pan pastels. You'd be maximizing dust using uh, things like unison and grinding them down. Okay, wondering, I've got Alyssa or Lisa asking, wondering how you do extremely detailed pastel drawings without smudging and keeping the details crisp. A lot of that is due to the paper, so pastel mat will allow many layers to go on there. Another thing is on the first couple of layers, I push those layers and smudge them with my fingers into the paper surface. That pushes them into the tooth of the paper that means I can then put more layers on top. And as long as you don't use too much pastel, don't put tons of pastel down, especially on those initial layers, you really should be able to get the, the details on top. I show how to do that on all my videos, so just really study the videos and experiment. And um, I don't have any secrets on the videos. You see everything I do. So if you duplicate what I do, and you're using similar supplies, it should work out and uh, work exactly the same for you. Uh, let's carry on. Doris says pan pastels have very little dust, correct? Um, yes, but then again, if you use lots and lots of pastel, the dust, you've got to remember that if you think of um, any pastel paper as kind of a rough texture, okay, some are rougher than others, but if you think of them like little mountains going up and down, if you put so much pastel on there, you fill all the uh, dips in the mountains, eventually it's just going to be sitting on the surface and that's when you get lots of excess dust. So when you're doing a technique like I, I use, you're not trying, you know, you're making sure you don't fill up those little valleys and create the dust. You see on my videos, I get very, very little pastel dust at all. Don't forget, you can ask oil questions as well. I've got some oil, a few oil questions. So let me just go through one or two of those. Clay Smith. Um, how do you know when to use thinners and when to use alkyd walnut oil? Okay, that's that's a really good question. Um, the 
only real time you would need the Alkyd Walnut Oil is if you was going to do a glaze. That's the only time that you would definitely have to do that because you wouldn't want to be glazing with just thinners. Now glazing, for those that don't know, that's when you thin a paint um, and make it semi-transparent. So think of that old um, way that people try to describe this is if you think of a stained glass window, when the light comes through, it affects uh, what it touches. So when we're doing a glaze, we're basically almost putting like a transparent film on top of the painting so that the color is being adjusted. If you use just oil thinners for that, so something like um, uh, Gamsol or the Bob Ross Odorless Thinners, then it would be so thin it could actually be brittle. Okay, so you wouldn't want to use that. That's when you would then use an Alkyd Walnut Oil. I would use M. Graham and the Alkyd Walnut Oil, the benefit of that is it dries um, quickly, by the next day at least. And when I'm using oil oils, I'm always using Alkyd Oil uh, paints. Got a crow going in the background, thank you for that. So I create or I complete most of my oil videos that you'll see online just by using thinners unless I'm doing that glazing. Okay, so I like to keep my supplies super, super simple. So virtually all of my videos show, it, show me just using thinners, enough to thin the paint so it'll come off the brushes. Okay, so Carol asks, what surface is recommended for acrylics? Aiming to do oil tutorials, but allergic to oils. The surface for acrylic would really be exactly the same as you would use for oils. So I personally like to use a very fine weave canvas because I've got the, the beauty then of being able to roll it up. If I, if I do a painting that's quite large, I can roll it up, put it in a tube safely and ship it internationally. I also like using panels uh, because they haven't got any grain at all. So you can prepare those yourself with some gesso. Um, the, the beauty behind that is if you're doing a landscape and you want it to look really realistic, then I don't like to see any grain in the sky whatsoever, any texture of the canvas. So that's when I like to use panels. So you can use both. As long as they're gessoed, you're fine to go. Okay, Gloria, so this is the last one on paints for a, for a little while. She asks, I'm going to have a go with acrylics when they arrive. Am I correct that I can follow your oil tutorials and use acrylics? That shouldn't be a problem at all. All you've got to remember is acrylics dry super fast. So unless you add a slow drying medium to it, you're going to find that it dries within minutes, whereas my Alkyd oils dry you know, substantially longer. You can probably still keep playing with it for half an hour or so. That means that when I'm trying to do a, a soft effect, perhaps I'm blending one area into another, the alkyds would dry much slower, so I haven't got to be rushing. I always found acrylics make me rush too much. That's why I've gone to alkyds. But if you are, have got to use the acrylics, there's lots of great artists that use acrylics. If they're doing it detailed, they generally work on a small area at a time. Okay, so that's those done. Let me just cross those off a second. I'll have another look, see what we've got here. Right, let's keep going. Uh, okay, Ryan, hey Jason, what's the reason you use the gray pastel mat instead of just the white or the colors? Okay, that's a very good question because it's a very important one. If you watch any of my longer videos on my Patreon channel, then you'll see that I talk about this frequently because it's very important. Um, let's think of it like this. If I use a white paper and I'm gonna uh, draw a subject such as, that's white, say a white cat, then when I'm blocking in the initial colors, doing the underlayer, if I put white down on the white paper for the highlights, it's not gonna show up at all. 
So what I've got to do then for the blocking in to make it look uh, solid, three-dimensional and real, I've got to put in the darks, the mid-tones and the lights and the background. And that becomes difficult in the first stages. You want as many advantages working in your favor when you first start um, a piece of artwork to make things easier. I'm all for making things easy. So let's think now, if I've got that mid-tone gray paper, now when I put the white of the highlight of a white cat down, it shows up. When I put the dark down, that also shows up. The mid-tone is acting, the paper is already acting as the mid-tone, so half my work is already done. So when I just put darks and lights in, all of a sudden it starts to look three-dimensional quickly. Now the paper, I do use grey quite often because it's neutral in colour. Because if you're using a mid-tone, uh, say blue paper, that's going to influence the colours when they go on there much more than a mid-tone grey paper. So that's the main reason I do that. The only time I really start using the bright white paper would be if I'm doing a subject that's extremely uh, light coloured all over or lightly toned all over. So perhaps flowers, uh, perhaps butterflies on flowers, bees on flowers. And I've got a video on that showing that and explaining why I do that as well. So only when I want to really punch up those colours will I do it. Okay, nice to see a few Patreon members coming on as well. Um, what's the smallest detailed pastel pencil you have done? Or perhaps what's the smallest size pastel I've done? Well, I've got a, a small cheetah that's probably around about um, 10 or 12 inches wide. And it's a cheetah lying down in grasses. I've got a video on my Patreon channel and a bit on YouTube, I think, as well on that. And I deliberately did that one just to push the abilities of um, detail with pastel. And by that, I mean, when you see pastels, you see lots of fantastically detailed portraits of animals and humans as well. And you think, wow, how do they do the detail? How do they get that much detail actually on there? Unless their hand is in the shot or pencils in the shot, you can't judge scale. And very often these drawings could be uh, 24 inches or 30 inches or, or larger than that. So I wanted to see how much detail I could actually get in on a small scale. And I got that whole cheetah in there nicely detailed. So keep in mind that pastel pencils will not sharpen to a fine needle point like colored pencils. So we've got to work a little bit larger because if you're working tiny, and you're trying to get tiny little details, you're going to be sharpening those pencils all the time. And that's a lot of wastage as well. So use it to your advantage. We've got the advantage where we can work large quickly and get those details in. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, I have got a question on colored pencils. I'm absolutely not an expert on that at all. I'm not even a novice with it, so I'm not going to um, answer any questions on coloured pencils unless they refer to a bit of pastel as well, because I'm not the person to ask about that. Okay, what's the biggest difference between gouache and oils? Do you think you can get realistic wildlife pieces with gouache? Absolutely. You can definitely get realistic. Uh, paintings with that. If you check out James Gurney, uses gouache frequently. I've also got a, a Rhino video. I think I've got a bit on YouTube. I've got a long version on my Patreon where I'm using gouache as well. The main difference with the oils is that, um, once again, gouache dries extremely fast, faster again than acrylics. It's almost instant. So you've got to use your brush strokes in a very direct way. It's difficult to blend with it. So, um, like I say, it's a, it's a completely different way of painting. I personally don't like rushing when I'm painting. I found when I was doing watercolors um, at the start of my career, then timing is everything. So that was 
rushing I was rushing a lot with timing with that gouache is the same for me acrylics although a bit slower is once again rushing I like to take my time hence alkyd oils and pastels right I just jumped to the bottom but let me just see if I can find some others I've got loads and loads of questions okay Iwa got Carbothello uh, pen pastel pencils which other pastel pencils would you recommend there's not a massive amount of um, different brands out there to be honest if you like the Carbothello ones as I do they're pretty much my favorite another brand that's very very similar in the way it reacts the way it feels is the uh, uh, Faber Castell pit range the colors are different um, but once again you'll be able to sharpen them with no problem at all when you start to look at other brands such as Caran d'Ache, Gioconda uh, they are much much softer the Gioconda are nice because they got some real punchy colors in there so if you do a lot with uh, flowers or uh, perhaps birds you may think about getting them they're not expensive at all but they are trickier to sharpen the Caran d'Ache are soft they got a lovely color range in there they're very expensive they're really really difficult to sharpen that's why I've only got a few of those so um, Pitt and the Carbothello you got that would be my two picks okay Margaret welcome when I trace onto pastel paper it leaves lines that are difficult to cover with the pastel I use a non wax transfer paper okay this is a question I get asked quite often I've seen it on my own work in the early um, ones that I was doing the problem is the transfer paper is going to be made up of graphite or something like that the issue is that let's say for instance you put you use a standard graphite pencil and you rub lots of graphite down on your paper on your pastel mat paper for instance it's not really that it's filling the tooth of the paper up the graphite is creating a slippy layer the pastel then hasn't got anything to adhere to so then it won't stick I've seen this happen with a couple of different papers and the secret to it is number one don't push too hard when you're transferring and second and more importantly is to use something like a putty rubber some blue tack or white tack or um, a, a softish eraser to just push onto the surface tap it down onto the surface of the paper onto your uh, drawing and remove virtually all of the transfer line so that you can see it like a ghost um, then you won't the pastel won't have any trouble actually going on top only if you've really put a lot of that graphite uh, down on there will it resist now that, that ties in nicely with another possible scenario people will no doubt ask me can I use colored pencils and pastels on the same drawing and the issue is the same here if you put the colored pencil which will either be wax or oil based as your first layer on the pastel paper then you've once again created that um, resistant slippy surface so then the pasta uh, pasta you can't get pasta in the UK the chance would be a fine thing then the pastel won't actually sit on the surface you'll find that it will just keep resisting all the time but you can put pastel down first and then you can get away with some colored pencil actually on top so if you wanted to do whiskers and things and you wanted something very very sharp and I show it on a couple more of my videos with whiskers then um, that would be fine the only thing I would elaborate on now with the uh, using colored pencils and pastels on the same drawing because no doubt somebody's going to ask me this so I might as well cover it now is that colored pencils um, when they're down on paper when you adjust the light to them they shine so you get that light ref reflecting back 
with pastels, no matter how much you put down, they will stay matte. So what you've got to keep in mind is if you're using a lot of pastel and a lot of colored pencil in areas, you're going to have one area that's completely matte and another area that's got a shine to it. Personally, I don't like that. So 99.9% .9 of my pastels would be either all pastel or all pastel and just the minimal amount of colored pencil, perhaps on whiskers, which wouldn't um, really cause much of a problem with that reflection. Okay, let's have another look. Let's have a quick drink. I've got my sausage dog mug. Right. Um, Paul, hi, have you tried Windsor & Newton watercolour pans? I recently did the cheetah in grass and found black ideal and quick for putting the spots on. For those that are not members on my Patreon channel and perhaps haven't seen many of my YouTube videos, then you, you may not know that um, I frequently, when I'm doing wildlife, with markings, so if, if we've got say a leopard or a cheetah with spots, it can, it can be uh, easy to lose where those spot positions are. So let's say for instance, we're doing a cheetah and you've transferred your drawing, you've transferred all the spots on there. When you put your first under layer of pastels, so the, the body color of the pastel, you may then not be able to see the spots easily. So what I usually do is paint in uh, with just a minimal amount of uh, gouache, black gouache, I'll put the spots in place. Then I can go on and put my underlays in and I can still see those spots there so I don't lose position. I personally prefer gouache, but you can get away with uh, watercolour as well. All I would say is uh, this. When you're using the watercolour, don't make a really thin watery wash because pastel mat sucks the water in very easily and you may find that that little marking spot oh, I've got itchy nose, oh, excuse me that uh, little marking spot will spread out I've tried and experimented with watercolour and gouache they will both easily allow pastel then to go over the top the thing with the gouache it creates a rougher surface and it feels very similar to pastel mat so that for me is more beneficial because I know it'll take those layers. The watercolor will work, but personally I rather uh, just normal designers uh, type of gouache. Okay. Let me just scroll down a little bit. Right, somebody says, Julie, I'm admiring your friend over your left shoulder. Any chance you could do a demo on him in pastel? So if that's the gorilla you're talking about, I've done um, a gorilla demo of this particular gorilla, but a different pose in pastel. And um, so I've done that already. And I'm doing him, the one that you can see actually in oils at the moment. And you'll see a video of that very soon. Right, so I'm gonna have a little read. Okay. I've got another question. How to define then the size of the pastel painting? Sometimes I pick small, which ruin my painting. Sometimes the other way around, how to pick the right size. Another very good question. And I know exactly what you mean. Sometimes, let's take that gorilla that's behind me, for instance. There's, there's a few things to keep in mind when I'm thinking of doing a drawing or painting. And if it's specifically pastel, you know we're limited that we can't go too small. So keep that in mind for a start. You could print out a little area of it and pretend with your pencil that you're actually drawing it. 
And do you think that you could actually do those details? Or would you be sharpening your pencil all the time? So I, I do that, I actually do that. And I, you can then look at the, the tip of your pencil and think, yeah, those details would come out, that's okay. So I know that's my, this, that size would work. Also, when I'm doing a subject like the gorilla, I'm thinking about the, the drama, the power that the, the artwork would create. So with that guy, that gorilla, I want him to look uh, dramatic, and when someone goes into a gallery, I want them to it to really have a presence. So it, they think, wow, look at that. If I did him too small, a lot of that would be lost unless I got really close to it. So I keep that in mind. And how I know whether I'm at the right size or not, I'll put that image on my screen. I've got quite a large uh, PC monitor screen and I keep zooming in and out until I look at a part of it, say his eyes and his face, and I think, yeah, that's where it's really got that effect, that drama, that power that I want. Then I'll take a, a, a rule and I'll measure that area and I'll print it out that size. When you print it out, you instantly know if that's got that dramatic uh, look that you're after or not. Sometimes you can then go a bit smaller. You may think, oh, that's a bit bit too big perhaps that's going to be a lot of work and I'll print it out a bit smaller but that's that's what I actually do now some subjects look really great small some some perhaps uh, intimate landscapes or perhaps a little wren bird you know so you've got to have a feel for it and it is a personal preference as well so I hope that at least answers part of that okay Lee is it okay to use a walnut alkyd medium to wet the oil paint in between each layer? I often find it hard to get the paint going on the canvas when I have left the painting dry for several days. If you're using alkyd oils, absolutely. No problem at all, that's exactly what I do. Any tips for painting? Realistic water. Yep, I've got a I've got some videos on that um, as well for you to look at. Some things, you know, questions like that's easier just to, to watch my video and to see it. But tips for painting anything or drawing anything, any subject, would be forget forget that it's the subject that it is. So you may, for instance, a classic would be perhaps a brass cup, and people would think. How on earth would I paint a brass cup um, or a silver cup even when everything's reflecting in it? How will I know all the colours, all the tones, all the mixes? How, will, how on earth would I ever do it? It doesn't matter to me if I'm painting or drawing a lion, a silver cup, a sky, a cloud. It's one colour next to another. Your printer can do it with limited amount of inks. If that can do it, we can do it. Forget about getting uh, caught up in the fact that this is a silver whatever. Actually study the reference or study your subject and look at the one color next to another, the one tone next to another. If you can duplicate that, it will uh, work out correct. What pastel paper works best for you? I've tried, tried virtually all of them. Uh, without a doubt, pastel mat. Okay, we've got another question. Do pastel pencils stop layering over too much pastel that is already on pastel mat? So basically you're saying, if you fill the tooth of the paper, will it stop layering? Uh, yes, it will. I've got a video where I really go into depth showing you this effect on my YouTube channel. And if you've got to that stage and you've filled the tooth of the paper, but you still need to get some form of detail or highlight on top, you've then got to look towards doing um, a softer pastel on top. A softer one has got more opportunity or more chance of sticking on top or sitting on top of pastel that's underneath. So rather than your pencils, you would then be, well, you would be looking at more softer pencils like uh, Gioconda or uh, Caran d'Ache. So you can see why I wouldn't be using them as the underlayer so much. You keep them for the, for the more final layers. 
or you would be looking at soft pass or sticks, sharpened up, or even things like um, Faber-Castell sticks that would be once again sharpened up and you would get away with some more detail on top. Okay, here's a good question from Painting Violet Skies. Thank you for all you do. Um, can I ask a question on oils? How do we judge what colors to use on the base for white fur? I tend to start too light. The main benefit we've got with oils is we can continue the layers pretty much indefinitely. So there's no real mistake layers. Every layer will be um, adjusted and refined upon with the next layer. Worst case scenario, if you did everything wrong, you can just paint over it and start again. So that pressure is gone. When you're looking at white subjects, and this is um, something I see very, very often, when you're looking at white subjects, it's almost never white. You've got to really look into the reference and look for those colors. Once again, I've, I've covered lots of this on other videos. If you go on my YouTube channel and search, use that search um, magnifying glass for something like color mixing or um, how to pick out the colors. I show you then how I use image editors to um, use the eyedropper tool to drag out the true colors so that your, your eye and your brain um, is not being fooled. You get to see the real colors in there and just go a little bit darker for your under layer. Okay, Michaela Simmons, do you ever wet your pastels? I have um, done that with pan pastels, with a solvent, so that I can show you how to uh, do very thin lines like whiskers with a brush with pan pastels, but in general, I, I don't actually do that often at all. I did a painting after that. I take a picture. The picture looks more beautiful than my painting. It is the same case. At, is it the same for me? Uh, absolutely not. My paintings are more beautiful than the pictures of my paintings. <laughs> but I, I know what, what you're saying here, I think. When you take the photograph of your painting, what's probably happening in your image editor or in your camera is that the contrast is probably being adjusted, maybe automatically even, and boosted. Uh, lots of novice paintings and beginner paintings, what, what they generally lack is contrast. Um, obviously, no, you don't always have to have real contrasty, dramatic, punchy subjects. Let's say, for instance, your you want to draw or paint a wolf in a mis misty scene, a gray wolf, then you don't want punchy, um, contrasty areas. But generally, probably three quarters of your artwork, you do. You want a wide range from light to dark. And I should imagine that in your image editor or in your camera, it's actually punching that up. And if you're a beginner or a novice, you know what, when you get into the halfway stage of your artwork, it's, it's sometimes a really good idea to um, take a photograph of the art, put it into an image editor and adjust it slightly. So perhaps adjust the contrast and things. And you th may then think, wow, that, you know, that extra punch has really made a big difference. So then you can go back to your artwork and actually do that in real life. What's the number one mistake you see less experienced artists make? Doris, funny you should say that because what I just said I think is definitely the number one mistake, that lack of contrast. Everything just becomes a mid-tone um, and it lacks, lacks a punch. It really lacks a punch. So if you imagine that artwork at the other end of a gallery, uh, it 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 look an inspiring. It would look quite drab. It wouldn't grab your attention. Whereas if it was really punchy, and I don't really mean you know, you haven't got to really um, overdo it. But if it's got a nice wide tonal range in there, it usually 
makes for for better artwork. Olga, what about using fixatives <laughs> on top of the pastels? Is it okay? I'll take a drink before I answer this one. For those that have seen me do the numerous uh, tests, I've spent literally probably 150 pound, don't tell my wife, on uh, various pastel sprays, alleged fixatives, and only one comes close to actually doing the job they're supposed to do, and that's Spectrofix. Um, but even that one can, uh, and the company doesn't lie, you know, they, they tell you the truth, even that can adjust some colors, can adjust some tones. But for me, it, it actually adjusted them less than all the other sprays I've tried. Once again, I've got a video on this um, that shows me actually uh, doing all that. Most, well, like I say, ev every one to some degree or another adjusts the tones and adjusts the colors. And some of them is dramatic. It ruins it straight away. Now I've had professional artists state online specifically, this spray is the best out there. It does not alter colors and tones absolutely so i buy it i'm using the same materials i do test strips because of my uh, quality control on and, and uh, research and development background I'm, I'm used to doing that type of thing where we test things out i did that for years before i was a full-time artist when i set it out in a scientific way mask off some of the pastel colors spray the, say the bottom of it let it dry, remove that mask. The difference is usually huge, dramatic. And I know then that can that I may have paid £10 for, £15 for, completely useless, complete waste of time. Goes in a drawer, never to be used again. I've done that probably 10 times or more. And some of them are slightly better, but never to an extent where I would have confidence in spending 8 10, 20 hours on a piece of artwork and then spray it for it to be ruined. If you're not bothered particularly about the uh, potential color changes, about the potential uh, tonal changes, perhaps some of these people, well, they're usually professional, but if they were beginners, perhaps they can't really notice the color change. As a pro, you should be able to see that. I just tell you honestly, I won't use it on my own work. I frame it behind glass. If I'm storing my work, I'll put glassine paper over the top so it doesn't smudge and is stored away. So it's not going to have a chance to be smudged anyway. So that's my take on pastel sprays and fixatives. And, and one more final quick thing about uh, pastel sprays and fixatives is very often they don't even fix the pastel. So you give it a couple of sprays, let it dry. If you get a, a Q-tip, a cotton bud, and actually just lightly go over it, half the time the pastel just comes off as easily as if it wasn't sprayed, so it doesn't even really protect it. You've really got to give it a good dose of the spray for it to uh, stick it down. Okay, let's keep going a minute. What advice would you give about marketing your art? Before the um, market crashed, I think it was about 2008, 2009, then we had a chance of selling um, artwork for reasonable prices in galleries, even after they took their cut. On eBay in particular, I used to be able to put anything up there, sell decent for the amount of time I was doing it, and everything sold. When the market crashed, then the buying of uh, luxury items, and I think paintings will be classed as a luxury item, that dropped drastically. A zero came off overnight for the price of the paintings and drawings I was selling. So I was lucky, fortunate enough to be um, have my teaching business online really taken off then so I could get out of that game. But basically, if I had to um, 
sell all my paintings to make a living I would definitely definitely struggle I don't think I would even be able to do it you've got a couple of options go for the high rollers where things like stock markets and that don't make much difference to them they've got unlimited funds sometimes and they're looking for the dearer the better uh, when they buy an artwork irrespective if it is better or not but you've got to get your name out there you've got to actually um, get your paintings your drawings in front of these people so you may have to work through galleries it's, if you're doing it online on your own website it's, it's very very difficult so I haven't got unless we go into this for hours on marketing and web marketing and promoting yourself there's no easy easy answer for that sorry yeah Doris says she really likes Spectrafix plus it's non-toxic exactly I think that's probably the only non-toxic fixative out there Okay, let's carry on. How do you price your art? As in a method by the inch, time, etc. I think that mm, difficult. But once you need, you've picked one of those. You need to stick with it. Okay, let's let's look at this for instance. So let's say for instance I did my Great Migration painting which was about 36 inches wide. Probably took me three weeks to do it. So if you said for yourself, perhaps you say I want to earn £200 a week or £400 a week or whatever. So say 200 to keep it easy and it took three weeks, £600 is what you're thinking you're, you need to, to sell it for so you can get enough money to, to live even so you need to take that into consideration um, with time if you was working per inch perhaps I would give you a crazy figure that nobody would even pay so the, the thing you always got to think about and I, I tell this to people is when you're pricing your artwork you can you can do a, a fantastic painting and you could say ten thousand pound or you could do the same painting and say one hundred pound whether it sells or not is who actually sees it and the value they put on it so you can whatever amount you say doesn't necessarily mean it it's going to sell now if you're looking at things like pet portraiture where there's a massive artist now that's doing that so it's an extremely competitive field then you need to look at the prices they're using because that's kind of set the um, the ground rule for what people will pay. These people will usually be looking around at various artists priceless and seeing a common kind of scale and we, you would need to work in with that. Unless you're extremely well known, unless um, you are doing something incredibly different than other people. Jill asked, do you prefer working from a printed or an on-screen version of the picture? Colours on screen look different to printed versions. Um, paint, colour, samples held up next to screen are hard to match. Exactly. The only real time I see a huge benefit in working from a screen is when you've got a, a subject that is all about the colour or all about... Um, the atmospherics so let's think for instance that we, we're going to going to do perhaps a stag on a Scottish Highland with a sunrise or a sunset behind it and it's all about capturing that light that's extremely difficult to print out unless you've color matched your screen and have color matched your printer and done all these things and 99% of people don't you're gonna to have to play a lot with the printout to actually um, get it anywhere near close. 
Also, when you're working from a screen, it's being lit internally, basically by bulbs. So that simulates the sun and what's happening in real life a lot better than a printout. When I first started painting, I was working from slide film back then. We didn't have digital cameras as I show my age, but that gave me the benefit, although I had to work in a dark room, gave me the benefit of being able to see things um, almost or as close as you could be to seeing it when you was actually on the scene. So with that then comes difficulties, as you've said, where it's more difficult to match the color. So if you're a beginner, you can't really hold it up as easily. You can do it, but um, you've got to keep your light consistent and things in, and it does bring in lots more problems. So unless you're doing something like that, I prefer to work from a printout because you then can color match more easily. Anya, do you plan to make more short videos like the first series example on a specific topic? Absolutely. It's all really about time and, and doing everything and bringing these live streams now, hopefully into people's homes that the people at the perhaps, well, we pretty much, the whole world is isolating themselves now. I'm the same as you guys. You get up days, you get down days. Some days everything feels really normal. Other days things feel anything but normal. So I'm hoping these videos will go in there and help. The issue is that obviously I've only got so much time to do everything. I've still got to try and get my um, Patreon videos out. My, that's my full length long ones. And ship my orders out because fortunately the post is still going and I'm doing these live streams as well. So I'm, yep, definitely on my plan to do more of those small studies and what I'm probably going to do is use the opportunity for these live streams to be doing that kind of thing so keep my real big um, long videos for my patreon channel where they can go into detail with that so I know not everybody have got four dollars a month at this time now it's one dollar a week but some some people are I've lost their jobs and I understand that so I'm trying to give out some of this free info as well. So yeah that's that's why I'm doing, doing it Anya as you elaborated on there. Don't forget though on my long videos you don't have to, they're never meant for you to be copying. Um, or really painting along. They're not really paint along type videos. What, what I'm always trying to do is show the technique so you can take that technique and do your own artwork and you could for instance watch um, perhaps my my um, lion cub video which is probably four, five, six hours long and take examples on how I did the fur on the face and the eyes and perhaps just do something smaller, a study on just the eyes and the fur around that will perhaps take you an hour rather than six hours. Sausage Dog is coming back. In case I didn't get, I couldn't answer any of the questions, I also got a crystal ball just in case so I had a backup plan. Um, okay, Phyllis. Nice to see you. Uh, love your work. What's your favorite pastel pencils? If I was going to pick definitely just one, it would probably be Carbothello, but the pit are almost identical. Heidi, I see some artists that attach or include a certificate of authenticity with their art. How important is that? With my originals, well, and when I was doing G-Clay prints, I always gave a certificate of authenticity out. I printed it myself on um, special paper and I would always sign it as well in, in gold or silver, just to make it a bit fancy. But I think more than anything, what that does is kind of gives the customer the feeling of um, that they're dealing with a proper artist, a bit of security that counts. Perhaps another artist is not doing it, so 
that may be the turning point that would make them buy your print or your original rather than theirs. So it's a competitive world, so personally, I would do it. Lorita, how would you go about copywriting your artwork? By law, um, our artwork is already copyrighted to us. So we don't have to do anything. Sharon, we understand that mediums used make pricing a lot different. Oil acrylic, graphite pastels, do you look at mediums used to price? It's all about uh, perception with the customer, I think this one. Oils are generally no dearer and probably cheaper than a lot of acrylics, but almost always a customer would think that an oil painting is more valuable than an acrylic painting, just because I think the old masters were using oils, so uh, buyers would generally attribute it to being more valuable. I think down the scale then they would look at graphite being less valuable. Pastels, I think that does okay to be honest. Um, I think that people buy them would the consumer pastels would probably be them being fragile and, and, and actually framing them. Oils would probably be the one that would sell more easily. Like I say, I think that's more to do with um, the perceived value. Margaret likes my sausage dog cup. Thank you very much. Okay, interesting one, EKS. Now this I get asked a lot, right? And I've got a bit of an issue with this one. Uh, is Patreon in medium sections? I'm only interested in pastels. Okay, no, it's not. Patreon started off um, probably three and a half years ago, my Patreon, when I was only doing oils. And that's how, it, that's how it started. So everyone knew they was getting oils with perhaps the odd bit of graphite here and there, a bit of charcoal perhaps, nothing more, 99% oils. Then I started, I discovered my love for pastels and I showed my work around online and then all of a sudden people were saying, I hope you've recorded this. I want to see you do pastels, put the pastel video up and there was a big call for it. So I started to do an oil and a pastel every month and I alternated them between the two tiers. I've got a $4 and a $9. I really got into pastel personally. I wanted to do it. So for a little while then I um, started to do more pastels and every now and again, I did a few more oils just to, you know, some subjects suit oils more than pastels and vice versa. We're at the stage now where I do both, maybe leaning a bit more towards pastels because more people um, seem to like it and because it's newer to me and I'm enjoying it as well, but I'm still doing the oils on there. So when people ask me, they say like this, um, look, I'm only interested in pastels. I don't want to be looking at oils as well. This is the answer I generally give them. I've got hundreds and hundreds, literally, of hours of pastel lessons on my Patreon channel. I've got hundreds of hours, thousands of dollars worth of oils on my Patreon channel. And I've got a little bit of colored pencil, a little bit of charcoal, a little bit of gouache, but they're mainly oils and pastels. The Patreon channel costs $1 a week. So if you pick a cheap pencil, it's around about half of a cheap pencil per week to have access to thousands of dollars of art instruction. I think that's a really, really um, reasonable price to pay a dollar a week. I'm not forcing anyone who's only into pastels to watch the oils as well. I'm not forcing anyone who's watching the only into oils to watch the pastels. 
there's plenty of instruction and new lessons coming out every month to keep everybody happy i think for four dollars a month for nine dollars you get access to everything that i've done on there for the last three and a half years so what i would say is don't even worry about it being in oil specific or pastel specific is such superb value just take and look at what you want okay so that's my take on that um, but saying that if you want to don't, you can actually use a search on there and search for just pastels or search for oils okay so perhaps you meant that even Phyllis, are pastels hard to mail? Won't they get ruined during the mailing process? How do you keep them from that from happening? I've got a video on YouTube showing uh, how I package and store pastels. That's also, so the way I store it is also the way I would package it. So you'd have a bit of MDF, thin MDF either side. But you've got to keep in mind then, if you do something large, then the package is going to be large. The prices go up. And that's the main reason why I chose oil when I was really selling a lot of originals just because I could roll them in a tube. You can do that with acrylics too. If you're doing a large colored pencil, you can roll it. As long as the customer don't mind it rolled up when it come out the other side. But with pastels, yeah, we've got to send it flat. So that's always something to keep in mind. Oil pastels, I've never tried, Sharon, so I can't comment on that. Yeah, you're right. Doris says that even though she doesn't do oils, she still loves watching my oil videos because the principles are almost identical. We work in generally from like a mid-tone to a dark to a light. Um, we're working in layers, whether it's oils or pastels. So I keep telling people on my Patreon channel, if you're only into pastels, watch the oils as well if you've got spare time because you'll definitely pick up something there as well because the principle of the art is, the creating of the art is the same. Now, whereas pastels and say watercolors are completely different, but pastels and oils are very, very similar in the way we um, build them up in layers and things. Hi everybody, I've got lots more coming on. Jill, with oils, do you gesso the canvas first? If so, how many layers do you do and how do you get it smooth? The easiest way is to buy it already gessoed, already primed. So when they say that the canvas is primed, that's what they mean, it's already gessoed. And a good quality canvas a decent quality canvas will have two or three layers of gesso on there and you then get to pick as well um, the smoothness so you can have a very rough texture some people like that you can have a very smooth texture some people like that you could also use something like um, you see if you, if you buy a gessoed canvas you've, you've then got to go through that whole process so personally I think it's usually more cost-effective to actually just buy the canvas already gessoed. If you're doing board, like MDF board, that's medium density fiber board, then you will be gessoing it yourself and do both sides, otherwise you could get warping. Gesso is acrylic, uh, usually. So what you need to do when you paint it, let that dry. So I paint, say, a layer, I let that dry, for perhaps an hour. You can speed it up with your hairdryer if you want, but don't get it really hot because it's acrylic, it's basically a plastic. If you get a real hot spot on there, it will bubble. So do your two or three layers, let it dry overnight. Then you come back, use some a very fine glass paper or sandpaper and sand the surface to the smoothness you want. Now, once again, because the acrylic is basically plastic. If you're using sandpaper and rub, rub, rubbing fast, you're 
creating friction. Friction creates heat. The heat will blister and melt the gesso. Then you'll have a hole in it and it's ruined. Okay, so less haste, more speed. Margaret, is rolled canvases primed? You can get it primed, yeah, no problem at all. It won't go cracking on you. Don't worry about that. Okay, let me go back to my list. Louise Miller, what do you do with your unsold paintings, if I've got any? Do you ever have a sale to move them on? After the market crash, 2008, 2009 I spoke about, I now don't even attempt to sell anything. Um, I just paint and draw for my own benefit, uh, for my Patreon members and my YouTube uh, followers and Facebook, I do it to show techniques and to challenge myself. I'm really fortunate I don't have to sell my artwork to make a living. So I haven't got that pressure. So what do I do with them all? I, I've got a video on YouTube showing how I package them and then I put them in a large folder. I've got a couple of, of my recent ones that's on the, the wall behind me. So I look at them after a little while to see if there's anything else I want to do or, or say you do something and you really think, wow, that turned out really good. Rather than stick it in a drawer straight away, I like to put it on the wall. There's nothing wrong with feeling a bit of pride in your own work. Um, sometimes that's frowned upon as being a bit um, egocentrical, is it? Or something like that. But I, you know, if I've done something good, I've done something good. I like to look at it. I'm proud of it. You, you take the proud pride in. And then after a while, I'll put it away. Perhaps, perhaps one day further on down the, the line, if this market crash now ever, ever recovers and people want artwork again, I'll pull them out and perhaps do a, a, a gallery exhibit myself. Ellen asks, how do you get a nice even underlayer with the hard pastel sticks like the Rembrandt on a surface like pastel mat? Beginners usually have a problem with this. Say you're doing a, an even background. You won't get that even background with just one layer of pastel. Uh, the Rembrandt sticks I, I love. They're not particularly hard, hard like um, a Conti stick. They're not soft like a Unison or uh, uh, one of the other brands. It's in the middle and I like that because I've got more control over it. So you could expect to do two or three layers. As you layer in on top, you're not worrying now about filling the tooth if it's a, a an even layer, there's no detail or anything in there. You want to get enough pastel in there that when you rub it in, that it creates that smoothness. Okay, so get your scrap bit of paper, pastel mat paper, use the same paper you're using, normally otherwise what's, what's the point of the experiment, and put enough pastel down, then rub it in, and then put some more pastel on top, rub in really lightly, eventually you'll see that it goes on perfectly smooth. Okay, pastel is the easiest medium to get that real even smooth finish as I did in, in uh, the elephant blue and the, the bird uh, blue skies I've got behind. So both those videos show exactly how I did it. As I said, I never, I never um, skip anything really in my videos. There's no secrets. I used to get so annoyed with art books and videos that kept skipping the vital stages all the time and that's why I do my videos so you get to see it all and in these Q&A's I get to explain it as well. So that's that one done. I had that question actually off a couple, couple of people. Anne asks what tape do I use to stop my pastel matte paper moving around? I just use standard masking tape and I usually pretty much only do it on the edges most of the time. Okay, so we've gone hour and 10 minutes. I've still got quite a few people online, so I'll carry on. We've still got the questions going. Deb asks, how do you keep the background clean from pastel smudging? When I've started with pastels, I was wondering why a lot of people, how do you know which, which you should do first, the subject or the background. 
after three years of, of using parcels myself and, and drawing, the conclusion I came to is if you've got a large area for a background that needs to be pristine, clean, you've got no details in there. So once again, the, the elephant or the, the hawk that I did, uh, which got just blue background in, I put it in last. If I put it in first, without a shadow of a doubt, when I've got other pastel, darker colors and, and, and things on the um, drawing, without a doubt, that's going to contaminate that blue. And sometimes it's difficult to go over the top of it if you've got something like a black that's on there. So that's the reason I keep those drawings that's got that, like I say, that pristine color, um, that's where I would put that in last. The other thing you can use as well is a marl stick, so basically a bit of wood, uh, something soft on the end like a t-shirt to keep your hand up from that pastel surface. Okay, so that's that one. Gunjan asks, do you use a jelly roll or a paint pen from a blacks and whites to finish a pastel drawing? Do they work well on pastel mat? No, I don't use anything like that at all. The reason would be, once again, let's go back to that uh, example of peaks and valleys on a mountain and your pastel is filling up the tooth of the paper. If you then use something like a jelly roll, which is basically an ink pen, it probably wouldn't stick on top of all of that dust, basically. So it wouldn't stick. So if I wanted to do um, something pure white on top, I'd be more inclined to use something like gouache paint uh, and just put a little dot on there if, if you must. Leah says, I think it's a lack of practice as my underpaintings are not good, which makes everything else harder. I think I need to stop and back up, maybe work from blurry images so I don't see any detail. Yeah, I, I see that a lot. Beginners, novices usually get drawn in by the detail. They think that um, detail equals realism and it really doesn't. The thing that makes something look real is the tonal value and to a lesser extent the colour but it's certainly not the detail. But beginners and novices generally get drawn in and they start detailing almost straight away. Um, so yes, if you work from a blurry initial reference photo, so just take it into your image editor and go something like image, adjust, blur, Gaussian blur, then you can take that detail out on your, on your blur slider that focuses the mind on what really matters, the larger elements, not the detail. And if you then just take it a slightly bit darker, so make it just go a little bit darker and print that out, that's a good underlayer for you to aim towards. Okay, so then you build on top of that. Pam asks, is it a settling in period after you've added a layer um, of pastel, meaning do the pigments continue to blend or change? They shouldn't. Um, they, it's basically pastel pigment just sitting there. there. There should be no reaction or anything actually happening. Susie Kemp asks, what's been the one piece of your own art that you have been most pleased with and you could never part with? When I first started uh, painting, that was pretty much, that feeling was with everyone because as you're progressing, you, you're getting better all the time. And each new one that I put a lot of work in, I got better with and I was like, oh, I don't really want to sell that. You know, that turned out quite good. I, I want to keep it. That's the difference between somebody who is doing it for um, a hobby and somebody who's trying to make a living out of it. When you're trying to make a living out of it, you then got to get over that and everything is for sale. You need to eat and live and pay your mortgage. So that 
goes quite quickly on the and gets reduced on the level of importance. My favorite piece of artwork so far was for oils, probably the Great Migration, because I put everything into that. Um, and also my baby elephant that I'd done with pastel because I was happy, really happy how that turned out. And there was lots of different elements I had to kind of teach myself from the texture of elephant skin to the uh, reflections of, on the water. So I was I'm blurred in the background, so I was quite happy with how that finished. So, so that's my favorite um, piece of art so far. Okay, Kai Simmons asks, I have a habit of getting my line drawing done, getting on my paper and then putting off starting. I don't know if it's the case or I don't want to mess it up. I don't know where to start. Is it a moment that you put off as long as possibly? Um, okay, Kai, I think I know what you mean by that. Let me have another drink out of the old sausage dog. Nobody commented on my t-shirt yet. Do or do not. There is no try. I like that one. I saw that online. I had to get one of those for myself with a Yoda. Um, okay, back to that question. Sometimes when we do a drawing, then we get um, a bit precious of it. We think, oh, that drawing turned out really well. I don't want to. I don't want to mess it up now. But what you need to do is not be so precious about the under layer, the under drawing. Probably don't put uh, so much detail into it, so much time into it. There's no need because you're going over the top of it. You're not going to see any of that. Um, especially with like under layers on oils, well, and pastels. So the thing with momentum and keeping going, the best thing of it is not to stop. So uh, it sounds obvious, but I find the more time that I um, leave in between work, like the gorilla that I'm painting now, I probably started that a few weeks ago. Now the problem I've had, it was, it was for the exhibition, well not an exhibition, I, was, I was decided to um, support a local art exhibition by putting one or two of my pieces in there. And I was going to demonstrate that just to help them out by creating a bit of interest so that an artist was actually doing something there. It wasn't just everybody coming and looking at uh, completed artworks. So I started that with the intention on doing perhaps a quarter of it. Uh, so when people came in, it looked um, partially finished. And um, with this virus business, all that's gone out of out the window now. So what I've got to be careful of with that drawing, with that painting, if I leave it too long, I can lose interest, I can lose the motivation that I had when I first looked at that reference photo, when I got that feeling, when I took that photo, that I really, I really want to challenge myself and see if I can create that um, drawing and make it, or that painting and make it really dramatic. If I leave it too long, I find between finding the reference and starting the artwork, I usually lose the motivation. So you need to keep the ball going. If you've got that snowball going down the hill, you need to keep it rolling. Now I've just today released a new uh, kind of art initiative challenge, um, 30 days of art. So it's hashtag JM, so that's my initials, Jason Morgan, JM, hashtag JM, 30 days of art. The whole idea behind it is to keep this momentum going. In times like this, our minds are, and thoughts are dragged off in all different directions. Before we know it, we're watching the news all the time. We're on our Facebook scrolling, coronavirus, coronavirus, coronavirus. Everywhere we look, we're being dragged and pulled towards it. If we can possibly um, zero in, laser focus our attention on our artwork keep it going a little bit five minutes a day that's all it takes we get a bit of that back a bit of us back so 
in is a long answer to your question but the thing is once you've got the transfer drawing done make a start straight away don't do the transfer drawing on a Monday and think oh I'll make a start of that now when I get chance on a Wednesday because probably something will happen on the Wednesday and then it'll end up doing it on the Friday and then your motivation is gone do the transfer of drawing at the time where you know right I've got two hours now I've got nothing to do your drawing may take half hour an hour once you've done that get straight on even if you just do a little bit do a little bit don't leave it at that stage get the ball going get the snowball rolling and then every day say okay five minutes I'm gonna do just five minutes on it and keep it going that's the beauty with um, that's the beauty with pastels and colored pencils and charcoals over things like oils with oils you've got to get your set out or if you you've got you're fortunate like me you can leave your paints out but they dry on your palette so you've obviously got this cleaning you've got to change your clothes in case you get something on there you know you've got those extra obstacles in the way to keep the ball going minimize your obstacles if you're going to be doing your drawing leave your pastels if you can out and ready so you've got five minutes you think okay sit down pick them up let's go for it get as many obstacles out the way uh, still got loads of people online so I keep going a bit more if you possibly can if you could click the like because we've had hundreds and hundreds of people watch this but I've got like 32 likes the likes help for this you know type of thing to spread out to a wider range where um, the algorithms and things that depend on these likes to see how popular they are so if anyone can just take a second to click the like that's why we keep asking for it to spread spread the um, the output of this so other people can actually see it okay let's keep going okay Shizu I wonder if I spell if I pronounce that right a lot of teachers have kept saying stop thinking this is precious it's really hard to think that way because you want to think this is going to be the best art I can make I think there's a difference between it feeling precious and holding you back um, than being inspired for this to be the best whenever I pick up a pencil whenever I pick up a brush I absolutely I'm trying my best uh, I'm never just going through the motions even if I'm just doing a little sketch I'm trying the, my best but I'm not being so precious about it that I'm so scared that um, I'm gonna mess it up if you know what I mean it's a that's a difficult one if you put in too much pressure on yourself the chances are you won't get to the end you know sometimes I've even done a drawing I, I did this a couple of years ago I did something and I knew at the end I was gonna rip it up just to prove a point that it's a fine balance the more you do the less you feel this precious business of oh my god I'm gonna I'm gonna do it wrong I'm gonna ruin it I'm gonna waste all that time remember especially I don't know why a lot of beginners and novices put this pressure on themselves right if you're doing a drawing for instance or painting and you spent 10 hours on it and uh, it turned out okay you know or it, it didn't turn out as good as you wanted right well you've just lost uh, 10 hours of your free time okay that you possibly spend a lot more than that watching TV or on social media a day or a week or whatever so you've lost 10 hours of time and if you're oil painting if you're doing something big like the gorilla behind me I probably lost no canvas because I can go over the top of it again so that's not a problem and the amount of paint I've lost was probably about two pound if that so I've lost 10 hours and two pound uh, nothing same with drawing if, if you're gonna be worried about expenses of it work smaller so then let's say we did a pastel and it took me eight hours I've lost eight hours but I haven't lost it because you know I've got the experience of 
the learning from it so I've, I've gained really I haven't lost nothing even though I'm not going to stick it on my wall because it wasn't that good um, and then I've lost a little square of paper but once again I haven't lost because with pastel mat I show you all my videos that you could actually even recover that paper by washing it off so I've got a YouTube video on that as well so nothing to lose you know nothing to lose take the pressure off you know you're doing the hobby to take the pressure to create pressure if you're a professional you're earning a living it's a little bit different <laughs> you, you need to kind of um, not make too many mistakes you're usually on a schedule with a, a time limit you've got an order you've got that pressure on you but if you've taken your time to become a professional so rather than a lot of novices I see they get uh, they, they, they do something that's pretty good perhaps it's a fourth or fifth drawing and then a family member will say can you draw my dog and you say oh yeah okay and they say how much and you say we well, better not do too much because it's family uh, 20 pound 50 pound whatever and they think Oof, I was open for cheaper than that but there we are okay 20 pound you may be doing 10 hours worth of work for 20 pound and uh, you're playing for the art materials as well so don't push yourself to be a professional when you're not at that stage yet when you get to be a professional then you get a lot less things go wrong because of all the experience you've got and the pressures off a bit that was a tangent I can't even remember what the initial question was once again the oxygen level has gone down in the room and sausage is back out Julie hi both my boys are tattoo artists they are trying to help me with my pastel drawing but sometimes I wonder if tattoo drawing has the same effect well talking about pressure <laughs> when you're a tattoo artist that's a, that's the one instance where you don't want to be making many mistakes whatsoever so they know how to deal with the pressure tattooing is not that sim similar to pastel um, it's more of a direct method really obviously drawing and things are, are similar okay let's keep going um, Sheila asks would you ever consider critiquing one of my older works that you didn't feel was great I've already got that on my YouTube channel It's about probably about four or five videos back um, of an elephant coming through some scrubland that I was fortunate enough to photograph in Botswana uh, point of case this is uh, a good example of something that I was really really happy with when I did that I thought wow I've arrived this is it that, that's superb a few years on I look back there and think oh hang on I wouldn't have actually done that I wouldn't have put that there I wouldn't have put this there I would have altered the light in perhaps and and even more years on again I look back at it again and that's why I did the YouTube video I thought you know I may not have even actually done that reference photo at all there's so much wrong with it these are the different levels of um, experience you go through I've been doing oil paintings for over 20 years if the painting I did on my first year was as good as the painting I do now on my 20th year there's no growth or development in there so expect to be able to look back on your older works as I did critique them yourself it's good experience uh, to see what you would do differently uh, now sometimes it's a lot a lot differently and this brings me to the point then where you can't rush experience that's the one thing you can't really rush I can show you all the techniques that I've learned over 20 years with oils and then tag on three and a half years with pastels I can show you all those techniques that will jettison you up and save you a lot of trial and error because I've done that trial and error myself so that's the whole reason why I 
why I teach. You don't have to make the same mistakes I did. So I can jump you forward in uh, techniques and knowledge like that. But I can't jump you all the way forward because you've still got to put in the work. You've still got to put in the time, the experience. I read a lot about um, neuroscience and the brain. I'm really interested in that type of thing. I've, I've, my wife will tell you the house is full of books <laughs> like that and I still add to them. I love to understand what's going on in the brain. When I first started oil painting, my paintings looked quite flat. There was not much variance in colour in there as well. The subtleties were missing. When I look back on it now, the subtle colours in the shadows in particular were missing. They were there in my reference photo, but I didn't have enough um, connections in my brain for my eye to see in the reference to my brain picking up those subtle colour changes that I could even see them so I was just never gonna no matter how hard I tried I couldn't get past that level and ability until I created those um, neurological connections the more you're doing it the more you get to see the subtle colors in the shadows the subtle colors in the in the highlights and the differences so in another 20 years um, I would expect to be able to look back on my work now and see fault there as well. Okay, so don't be too hard on yourself when you're a beginner or a novice to thinking, oh, it's just not as good as I want it to be. You can only make these connections at such a speed. But the more you practice, funnily enough, the quicker these connections get made and the, the um, better you get, which is how it should be. If everything became instant and easy, we're a real instant uh, society now, I think personally it'd be a bit boring. I like the challenge. When I'm looking at a reference and I'm not just doing something that I want to show a technique perhaps on Patreon, I, I really want to push it. An example of that would be the eagle that I painted in oils with the uh, mountains behind the snow-capped mountains and the clouds. When I push myself like that, I'm trying to capture lighting effects, I'm trying to capture detail, subtleties. That's when I'm pushing my own ability. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next one. I think I've got a few more questions going again. So Sheila, that was the answer to yours. Yeah, Maria said that she actually did a watercolour and, and ripped it up with the purpose of this is going to be a practice piece. You can you can have a piece of paper and say, this is just for practice. I'm not creating an epic, my best, my anything like that. This is a practice. Okay, you can do it, do a subject. You're not going to be putting this on the wall. You know this is practice only. And that takes the pressure off. Right, let's keep going. Okay, have, have I answered every question? We've been going for over an, one and a half hours. I've got 55 likes now, so I went up 20. I wish I'd been asking this. I'll know now in the future every 15 or 20 minutes to ask if viewers could possibly click the like to help this video um, go even further. I'll just scroll through a bit quickly to see if I've got anything else to pick up on. I'll do more of these, perhaps I'll wait a month or so before I do another Q&A. So that I give you all a chance to, to build up on it. Let me just check my Okay, Susie, suggestions for cheaper pastel paper for the 30 day art challenge. Okay, 
is an easy way to make your paper cheaper for a start. If you are using pastel mat, you know that's my favorite. Works more, works more. Four inch studies, something like that, that would do it. So all of a sudden then I've reduced your price by say a quarter. Also on YouTube, I show how to make your own pastel paper. Now I, I've tried lots of different papers and making your own one with a pastel ground is remarkably similar to pastel mat. It's remarkably similar. Don't think for one minute that just because you're painting on this ground onto a, a, a thick, uh, say watercolor paper, smooth paper, that it's going to be rubbish. You can definitely get layers on there. I say I've got that video on YouTube, it may even be on my Patreon channel. Um, and that shows you how many layers. I'm, I'm actually demonstrating a tiger eye, I think, on there. And it comes out really good. So for things like a 30 day challenge or practice pieces, that actually works. I usually tell people to practice on the actual paper that they're going to use. Um, otherwise, the kind of practice doesn't really make sense because whatever you learned on the other paper is not gonna really work that well on the pastel mat paper. But definitely doing your own ground, they're not really dear to buy. Um, th that definitely works. Melanie, on average, how many pastel layers in a particular spot? You know what I think, looking back on it, I think roughly about four. I never counted, but it seems like I'm doing about four. Sheila, are pastels all light fast? No. They're not, but they've got more pigment in than any other medium. And unless you're going to go through, okay, so let's say for instance, now you get a set of Carbothellos and say there's 60 or 72 in that set and perhaps five or so are lower on the light fastener scale. You can go through, eliminate those out your set. So then you buy pit as well and you do the same and eliminate those and you keep going like that and you find usually that is more often than not the same type of colors that you're eliminating all the time so you end up with sets that's got like a section that you can't uh you haven't got of colors or you can go and buy karen dash that perhaps has got really good light fastness across the range but then you're paying three times the amount for pencils and don't forget people think with light fastness if I use a pencil that's low down on the light fastness, say a red, well, in, in a year's time, that red will disappear off the drawing. Well, the thing is, when they check in light fastness, they're doing it like under museum conditions and UV lighting directly on there and timing and, and all that. Unless you're going to put your artwork somewhere that's going to be in direct sunlight, perhaps out in a conservatory, which is somewhere I would absolutely suggest nobody puts any artwork whatsoever anyway, because the temperature is going to go through the roof and drop down. You're going to get damp. You're going to have UV light. Um, so if it's in a normal home, it's, it's not being subjected to extreme UV anyway. So personally, I just use all the pencils, but you know, people can do what they want. They can be as strict as they want. I've seen some of the real best pastel artists that I really look up to, um, like Eric Wilson. I think he uses the whole set. I've, I've certainly pretty sure I've seen colors that he's using that I'm using that are not exactly at the top of light fastness. So personally, I'd rather just create, to be honest, and don't worry about getting into all the uh, discussions about that type of thing. Okay, let's have a quick look. Can we have chocolate biscuits next time, Colin? You absolutely certainly can. If you were allowed to go out of your isolation, but don't forget, you should only be going out for essentials, but yes, chocolate biscuits probably do class as an extremely essential item. If you get stopped by the police, you can always say that Jason had another live Q&A coming up and you needed chocolate biscuits for that, and I'm sure the police would have no problem whatsoever. 
can you Susie can you still get detail on smaller pastel mat yep I answered that one look up my um, little cheetah in the grass it is actually just up by there so it's about 12 14 inches wide I think I've got tons of detail in there but you know what here's the thing with detail if you've got your painting or whatever on the gallery wall and you're let's say from me to the screen two foot back you can see lots of detail on there if you step back another three foot a load of details gonna disappear drop off but it still looks pretty a good piece of art it still looks real if you go back another five foot virtually all the details gone but now you're seeing the major colors tones uh, perhaps the um, major indications of um, the markings and the spots on the animal but it still looks good go back another 10 foot and it can still look good but you know if you haven't got your tones right and you haven't got your colors right then the painting or the artwork just falls to pieces the detail is the least of what should be your concerns number one tonal value lights and darks number two color number three detail in that order calling says Jason is ignoring us as you're doing jokes on the feed well yeah we've got the coffee and uh, biscuits jokes going on there now we've got some avocado little pictures and you carry on I'll, I'll carry on trying to keep answering some more questions owner owner asks can you get uv protective glass absolutely yeah if you take it to a gallery perhaps they even use as standard i know you can get uh, um anti-reflective they very often use that i should imagine uv protective glass what it depends on then is how much you are actually going to spend when you start adding these things on top um, the prices start to definitely start to go up okay i think i've gone through just about all my questions on my sheet must have answered at least a hundred uh, questions let me just have another quick look if anybody got any more now's your chance oh here's a good one angel gardener how do you feel about art competitions are there specific ones you recommend submitting work to well I can 100% tell you I've never ever placed anywhere I don't think in an art competition I've entered a few perhaps three or four they are usually really subjective they usually uh, wind me up a bit we've all seen various things like um, landscape artists of the year portrait artists of the year various things like that and we've turned around and said I don't I can't believe that person won or I can't believe that person lost like I say it's subjective if you want to do it for a bit of fun I don't see any problem with it if you're in it to win it then you have probably got a bit of too much of yourself invested in there and you're probably setting yourself up um, for a bit of heartache if you lose which if there's 10,000 in there you probably got 10,001 chance of losing so personally I don't bother um, like I say it's usually really subjective if you want to give yourself the best odds if you know who's going to be on the panel of judges I'm not saying to pay them off uh, but I am saying to probably take a look at the type of artwork they do themselves although to be honest half the time the judges are not artists they are uh, apparently experts uh, like they've learned that in school but um, if you look at their work if they are artists which I would rather and say I was entering a contest I would rather have experts judging me like uh, John Banovich Eric Wilson and um, perhaps John Siri Lester 
and those type of people that create realistic, meaningful art themselves. And I think I'd be in with a chance. If all the judges are into abstract art, they just probably are not going to get what I do anyway. So uh, that's all I would say. If you're going to do competitions, try and give yourself a little bit of uh, a little bit of a chance like that. Uh, let's have a look. Three Catkins has just joined, finally got in. Just when I'm coming to the end, I've been going now for a round hour and 45 minutes. And we still got about quite a few people on you. So any more questions? Because don't forget, you can always look back at this video. It'll go um, onto my YouTube channel, I think within the hour by the time YouTube processes it. And then you can obviously uh, look at all the comments and questions and see my answers on there as well. Okay, Hazel. Hi from Ontario. Hi. I have uh, trouble with trying to do a picture much larger than A4. Any tips to get me started on a larger picture? If you're only printing out your reference photo at A4, then you're going to struggle sometimes to see. Let's let's take for instance that gorilla you see behind. That's a, that's a reference photo peeking out over the um, over the my shoulder there. My drawing is off to the to the side. The printout that I've done is life size to the to the painting that I'm doing. And the reason I do that, and I've even seen pros make this make mistake, right? That when I print it out, everything is the right size. It's the same size I'm going to paint it or draw it. So I can see the individual hairs and how big they need to go. If you've, you're only working from an A4, all of a sudden your brain has got to compute that scale up. And that makes it much, much different. This is why lots of good portrait artists, they paint at a certain size where they can walk, they've walked back and forth so that when they glance to the left at their live subject, it's the same size as when they're looking at the painting that they're going to do. If you understand what I'm doing, if they want it bigger, they walk closer. If they want it smaller, they go back further. It shows you then how big on that gorilla, the fur strokes, how thick they need to be, how wide the individual hairs are. Now I've seen a really, really top professional wildlife artist and he's done a, a picture of a, it's, it's either a cougar or a, a lion or something like that. And it's a real zoom in of just a portion of the face. And um, so the eyes are superb, the color is superb. And the individual hairs on there, he must have used a zero zero brush. They are so tiny that they are completely out of scale with how big the hairs should be. They should be much thicker. If he'd printed the print out, and I assume he didn't, and worked from that, he would have seen that the hairs needed to be thick because if my a hair on my head, only on the sides, granted, is 10 microns when the photo is that big, when the photo is that big, it may be 100 microns, so it's got to be bigger. So print out um, to the scale would be my tip. If your printer will only do A4, I'm sure I've got videos there on Patreon as well that shows how to um, join your print together to make like a big poster of it. And then you can fold it up and uh, put that by the side of your artwork. So if you're working on say the left eye, you fold it so you, you can just see the left eye and put that by your artwork. Okay, let's have a quick look for some final ones. What measurement is A4? Elaine asks. That's basically 11 by 8 inches. Oh, there we are. Someone already answered. There we are. 11.69 inches by 8.27 inches. 210 millimeters by 297. 
so I say basically 8 by 11 that, that's just standard um, printer size so I got 66 likes at the moment do you think we can get to possibly at 70 before I go I've been doing this now for an hour and 49 minutes or a little bit longer than that it's been a lot of fun I hope you've learnt well picked my brain a bit I didn't have to even I haven't even had to uh, use the crystal ball at all on this session so things haven't been too difficult if ever I get a really difficult question then the crystal ball without a doubt is coming out I'm glad as well all, you can all hear me all right I didn't have any of those little uh, teething troubles on this is my only my third uh, live stream so uh, we had a little teething trouble, trouble for about 30 seconds on the last one and um, we've got all that underhand so I'm learning as I'm going along myself it's quite a steep learning curve doing doing this type of thing so as I said I'll, I'll bring it to, a, to an end quite soon another video I should be bringing out is um, talking about those lights uh, art by Esther you've just joined I'm just about to finish if you've got a question you've got a good 15 to 20 seconds so ask it quick I will be talking about the daylight lights that I'll be using they they are groundbreaking for me in the studio at last I found a light that takes up virtually no room that gives an even coverage of light that's daylight that um, is not hot so you're not baking under there I was baking under my studio lights literally baking because I was using turkey based in uh, tins if anybody have seen me went do those videos where I showed how I made those and I've used that for probably 10 years which worked but all of a sudden now I've I've managed to get these studio lights that are much um, much better they really don't take up hardly any room they're totally portable they're very inexpensive so I'll be bringing videos out of those because I know a lot of you guys is going to um, find that really useful to get these these lights and you'll get that offer on there as well I think it's around about 15% off so that's that's nothing to be uh, sniffed at either okay yep yeah, got over that 70 lights we got the 75 like I say the only reason I ask about those is frustrating I know for people that view these videos I know when I watch YouTube youtubers and they saying hit the bell hit the like the reason is it, the video actually goes out further so I've got on YouTube oh I don't know probably 20 30,000 followers something like that I'm lucky on my videos if I get a thousand views on them because they just don't go out and, and reach these people and on Facebook it's even worse so we, a lot of us youtubers bring a lot of free content out to people and then they throttle it all back so it doesn't reach the people that that really want to see it so that's a shame so I know it's frustrating but that's why we just say hit the bell hit the like and hit hit all hit everybody right here we go uh, is there any more at all yeah Mike Baker he's the guy that does all the technical stuff behind my uh, Patreon and my um, he helps out tremendously my he built my uh, new website jasonmorgan.co.uk we've got the companion site that on my patreon makes my patreon pretty much different from virtually everybody else's people have joined various patreon channels and they found I can't find the videos I can't find the photos I can't find this and that I think Mike could agree that we was pretty much the first ones then that went out and created a dedicated website that brings everything together in one place so that it's super easy to find all my hundreds of videos and every, everything else and do these art challenges and this month we've got a, the art challenge was uh, to, to do something with monkeys and that challenge we need the members to finish off their voting now and what we do then we give out some we've got some some really good um, sponsors with rosemary and cold brushes and pan pastel and I offer a critique as well to the to the person that gets voted um, as the most favorite in that so okay any more oh Susie says I've actually got 59,000 followers so that's better than I was expecting 
There's a bell pen, yes, usually under the video on the right hand side, normally. That's a notification bell, so you'll get a notification when I'm bringing out a new video so you don't miss it. And obviously you can subscribe as well. Susie asks, can I say the names of the artists you mentioned that you respect and inspired one more time? Absolutely. Eric Wilson's a UK artist. I always looked at his work. He's, he's fantastic with oils. And he started doing pastels years and years and years ago. And he really took it to another level. When I saw his pastel work, I thought, wow, the, it just looked like oil paintings. It didn't seem to be any limit to the detail. The colors were fantastic. The scenery He's a real brilliant artist. Fantastic, nice guy. He always answered my questions. Lots of these pro artists, they, they are, um, like to keep their secrets to themselves. They think, you know, if I tell you this, you could be better than me. You could uh, do, do something then that's going to take away my value. But what we normally find, that the, the more we give out, what I found is the more you give, the more you receive. And so I never hold anything back. I tell everybody everything I know. When I've got enough time to, to tell, like I get lots of emails every day asking this and that, and I haven't always got time to help everybody. That's why I do the Patreon channel. But every time I asked Eric anything, he always helped out. So Eric Wilson, 100%. Um, for me, the, the person that really inspired me a lot when I saw their work to, to try really hard, um, they were right, like right at the top of the game, pushing the boundaries. That's John Banovich. He's just done a, a, a painting of a whole troop of mountain gorilla. I think they're life size. It's one of the most phenomenal paintings I've ever, ever seen. You know, it takes a lot of a lot out of an artist to do a painting that large and that detail. It's not something you can just chuck paint at the canvas and it, it flows from you really takes a lot physically and mentally out of you he's also done life-size elephants as well so that's John Banovich absolutely incredible does a lot for conservation um, so, so those were the two that I mentioned earlier on okay so I have a last quick look Susan asks, how can we view your artwork, my oil paintings? Um, I think we, we're, we're about to put a gallery up on my new site, um, but you, you can see them on YouTube, my more, more, more up-to-date ones, uh, but we will be putting the gallery on there. If you look at um, Fine Art America and type my name in there, you'll see some of my older works. On there where you can order prints I don't do a lot with prints these days like I said when that market died years ago but I've, I've got an online presence through um, through Fine Art America so you can actually get prints through there and you can see the Great Migration and things like that actually on there okay last question or so we're up on the two-hour mark just about if my studio is dark green, but I have daylight bulbs, will that affect my drawing? It will. Well, when you say drawing, if we're talking pastels with colours, if you're talking about graphite, it's irrelevant because you're just working in shades of grey. The extent to which this is going to affect your artwork, put a white piece of, piece of paper there where your, your drawing is, where you're going to work, light it up with daylight bulbs, your daylight uh, tubes, step back and look for the green color cast on there. That's, that's the amount that that's going to affect it because it's going to push your colors and sway them wrongly. You may find your daylight bulbs are bright enough that you the paper looks pure white anyway. So then it's not a problem. But as you can see with my studio behind, it's neutral colors 
uh, it's light colors as well it's not white I didn't want it to be too stark but I have chosen uh, you know like um, light creams and this is a cork wall to the side so lots of earthy colors and neutral colors which you generally find in in wildlife work I wouldn't for instance want to paint it uh, completely blue or, or green or yellow or, or, or a color that could uh, really bounce the light around and put it onto the artwork that then creates yet another uh, challenge to overcome and generally I'm all for making things easy so if you can keep you know um, neutral colors around that's all the better if you are finding it's extremely influencing your drawing perhaps it'd be a way for you to put behind you uh, a sheet a bed sheet or something to, to put that there so that, that light is not bouncing onto your artwork okay so I think we're just over two hours so I'm going to call it a day and if you've got any more questions um, you can put some in the comments below or even better save them and get them ready and when I've got enough questions to go uh, for the next video then we'll um, be able to do that and I'll, I'll have some questions like I've got my sheet here already so thank you all for uh, tuning in and I'm up to 81 likes so that definitely works I wonder if I could get a hundred next time but thank you all for tuning in for all your questions just having another another quick look I think we're just about done hope this has been a little bit of light-hearted relief as well from the news that virtually everyone's drawn into um, from your normal day these are meant to be you know just drop in drop out try and do a bit of artwork in your life um, or craft anything like that if you if you're allowed to and if you can get out in nature that's great I know I usually feel better if I can get out in a bit of nature as well so I think I'm just gonna call it a day I'll uh, just about end the stream thanks everyone get lots of thumbs up and likes and and all things like that don't forget you can go to my patreon channel if you want to see my long videos so that's all the W's dot patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash wildlife art all in one word and like I say for around about a dollar a week I think that's pretty good value that you get access to hundreds and hundreds of uh, videos it saves you a lot of money really because um, the, the, the thing is if you're buying the wrong pencils if you're buying the wrong paper if, if you're doing anything like that then you're just wasting uh, valuable money and funds we've all got plenty of drawers where we've got this stacked full of uh, different bits of kit okay lovely to see you here and um, that's another fantastic artist to follow that's b-o-k-k-e-i i watch her on youtube some superb um, paintings and drawings on there i love watching her work and so that's a definitely an artist i would recommend you all to to check out she does some really brilliant artwork so once again thanks everybody for uh, following me and watching me for two hours and i'll see you all again real soon